Well, good evening, everyone, and happy Sabbath. It's nice to see you here uh, this evening. And we're continuing our study on the three angels' messages of righteousness by faith. And what we're looking at, what we looked at last week, and what we're going to continue to look at is the book by G.I. Butler, who was the General Conference president at the time, a book written in 1886 on the book of Galatians. It's called The Law in the Book of Galatians. Um, and uh, so we read some of this, and we're going to read more, and we're going to discuss it. So anybody who has any input or questions or observations, um, feel free to join in. So uh, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the Sabbath and for the blessings of this past week, for the trials and difficulties that we face that um, call us to call upon you, that encourage us. And we know, Lord, that sometimes there are things that are very difficult, but we know that you understand these things. And so we ask that you can continue uh, to be with us, be with each person. May your angels watch over them and their families and friends. And may we be a witness to all around us. We ask for forgiveness for our sins. We know, Lord, that we are unlike you. And um, we want to be like you. And so we come into your presence that your light can dispel the darkness in our hearts. And that we can see clearly our sins and your power to forgive us. Please be with us now as we open your word together. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning, or good morning, good evening, and happy Sabbath again, everyone. And um, so we, we're going to be reading here. Now, I just want, so we had read this previous paragraph, but we need to read it in order to understand the, the paragraph that we actually should be starting on. Um, so what G.I. Butler has has argued about um, at this point of the book is that when we have people teaching that the law in Galatians is the moral law, it undoes one of the main arguments that they were using to fight against those who were antinomian, that is, those who believe that we're no longer uh, observing the law, that we don't have to keep the law. So, so they would say, well, under the law, the law is the moral law, and since we're no longer under the moral law, that means we don't have to keep it. And so G.I. Butler's argument, and, and many Adventists at that time, is, well, the law that's being referred to is not the moral law, but the ceremonial law. And so that, that's his, his main argument, and that if you say it's the moral law, then you're on the side of our enemies. Now, of course, Wagner has an explanation for that. So even though he believes it's the moral law that we're no longer under, it's not so much about the law, it's about what it means to be under the law. So to be under the law, according to the Bible definition, is to be under its condemnation. That's what Wagner is going to be arguing in his book that responds to this book by G.I. Butler. Um, so uh, G.I. Butler does this argument and say, well, the whole issue, this Judaizing issue, was that they were trying to make people to go back to the ceremonial law, circumcision and all these different things uh, that, that were observed under the ceremonial law, these things were done away, so we're no longer under that law. That's his argument. So he says, um, but did the Jews take kindly to the new order of things? Far from it, dealing with that you could be saved through Christ. Uh, the thing that maddened the most of all was the intimation that their special privileges were taken away. These had served to exalt them in their own eyes, and they had used them for ages to exalt themselves above others. They had been very zealous in proselytizing among the nations because of this superiority. And now we have this lowly Nazarene and his poor despised fellows 
or followers, pardon me, um, uh, who have never been honored as learned or talented, place them on the same level with others, uh, was like destroying their whole stock of trade. Okay, so I don't quite understand that sentence. They had been very zealous in proselytizing among the nations because of the superiority. That makes sense. And now to have this lowly Nazarene and his poor despised fellows who have never been honored as learned or talented, place them on the same level with others. Oh, I see. Place the, the Jews on the same level with others. Was like destroying uh, their whole stock in trade. I don't know what stock in trade means, but anyway, that's an expression. I've heard of stock and trade, but not stock in trade. But anyway, uh, their sacred privileges and special blessings were the only things they had to boast of. They were oppressed by the Romans, and despised by the Greeks as being ignorant of philosophy and not generally liked by the nations because of their pride and vainglory. To take away their only claim of being God's peculiar people was more than they could endure. Their hatred was especially bitter against the Apostle Paul because he, more than any other, clearly defined and demonstrated this fact. He was the Apostle um, to the Gentiles, which made it necessary for him to make this fact prominent. He pointed them to Christ as their only hope. Um, they had nothing to gain from circumcision and the special privileges it represented. Hence, we see the Judaizing teachers representing the various sects of zealots among the Jews and the Hebrew disciples who were not willing to accept the truth as Paul taught it. Um, opposing him, following him from city to city, persecuting, and in many instances trying to kill him. They were exceedingly zealous for circumcision and the law of the fathers. The hardest battle the great apostle had to fight was upon this very ground. So he's trying to lay down what the issues are in in the book of Galatians. Right? There were really two leading questions which required attention as the gospel went among the Gentiles beyond the confines of Judaism. The special circumstances that had surrounded the Jewish people for ages in the past made these questions prominent. Now that the new order of things was introduced, the Jews and Gentiles stood alike upon the same basis. One was the binding claims of the law of God upon all mankind, and the special fact, connect, fact connected with it that the Jews were condemned by that law as sinners and hence needed a savior just as much as others. The other was the fact already referred to, the cessation at the cross of the types and services pointing to Christ with the special privileges granted to Israel as God's peculiar people, symbolized by circumcision. Until these positions were well understood and the great principles growing out of them were thoroughly comprehended, the gospel could never accomplish its destined work in the world. The Christian system would be in disorder and confusion. For Jew and Gentile alike to have a savior, both alike must be sinners. Thus, both could come into one brotherhood and constitute one family. But this could not be if this middle wall still stood as a separation between them. Hence, it must, must be thoroughly understood that it, that this was broken down. Now, when we read, uh, A.T. Jones, uh, 1895 General Conference Bulletin, he's going to deal a lot with this, this middle wall of partition, right? So he's referring to this. This is a separation, uh, between God and man. And only secondarily is it a separation between man and man, right? So, um, so Jones shows that. Um, so what we see here in Butler is, is this idea that we have this ceremonial law and Paul was basically coming to say the ceremonial law no longer matters. All that matters is the moral law. And, and there's kind of a truth to it in some ways, right? So there are truths here. We know that obviously the sacrifices with the death of Christ are not going to be uh, pointing forward to Christ anymore, right? They, would, they could be pointing back, but that temple, the veil of the temple was ripped in two, showing that Christ had fulfilled those things. And then the other issue that he sees is this issue of the Jew and the Gentile. The Jews don't like the fact that the Gentile 
aren't going to be observing some of these rites and ceremonies, right? So, so that's that's the basis that that Butler is using here. So he says both both these facts were unpalatable to the Jew. He greatly disliked to be reckoned a common sinner with the hated Gentile. He strenuously contended also for circumcision and its attendant privileges. Hence, it was necessary that both of these great facts should be faithfully developed and the underlying reasons given for this new arrangement. Paul was the man specially raised up of God to do this work. Now, the question that I have here um, for people to kind of think about, are these Judaizers Christians or are they just Jews who have are, are opposed to Christ? I believe they're Christians. They're just kind of misled, I guess. Or right. Hanging on, so, to their old, or third, hanging on to, to uh, some right. tradition. Okay. So if they are Christians, if they're accepting Christ, they obviously are accepting the idea that they're sinners and that Christ died for them. Now, it might be true of the Jews who aren't Christians that this would be a problem. Right. So this this conflict wouldn't really be happening with the with the Jewish Christians. Right. That, otherwise, they're, they're not really even understanding Christianity at all. Now, we know that the real issue that they're going to be looking at is not the whole ceremonial law. Uh, there are going to be things like circumcision. Right. So circumcision becomes a sign of being a Jew. It's what makes you a Jew. Right. You're, you're circumcised and, and on the eighth day. So you're, you're a Jew. And so the idea that circumcision was not important becomes one of the issues. The other one is food sacrifice to idols. Now, is food sacrifice to idols um, explicitly a part of the ceremonial law? Like, is there some some aspect of the ceremonial law that's done away if you in, in that issue of food sacrifice to idols? We'd have to say no. There's not really anything about it at all. It's just a practice of the Jews that they would not eat food that had been sacrificed to idols. So, so again, that's not really part of the ceremonial law. So, so his argument here doesn't really make much sense to me because it's it's not really dealing with the ceremonial law per se, right? It just has to do with practices that they that they want the Gentiles to observe, right? Now, now Paul knows that, that these things are connected, right? So there's going to be a connection to the ceremonial law, but we have to understand how he sees that connection, what it is that they're they're actually asking people to do. Okay, so uh, Butler goes on, he says, we shall claim that in the epistle to the Romans, he fully considers the former question. Um so dealing with uh, circumcision and the privileges and so forth. And in the letter to the Galatians, the latter. Um, so or the latter would be uh, the circumcision, I guess. The other one would be the separation of the walls of partition. Okay, got it backwards. Okay, we cannot agree with some who claim that the design scheme or argument of the epistles are substantially the same. We freely admit that there are expressions alike in both, but we believe that the main line of argument and the ultimate object in view are widely different and that many of the similar expressions used are to be understood in a different sense because the argument of the apostle demands it. And I would disagree, actually. I don't think there's any difference in Romans or Galatians in the main line of argument. Um, but he has this for a reason, because there are some statements in Romans um, that quite clearly show that the law there is not the ceremonial law that's being referred to. So we'll, we'll see that in when we get to Wagner's uh, response. In the other epistles of Paul, these facts are averted to, but in none of them is the argument anywhere near so fully developed. It does not look reasonable on the face of it that the apostle would have principally the same object in view in two different epistles. Okay. Is that, does that make sense to you? That, that the Apostle Paul um, would have the same object in two different epistles? Does that seem unreasonable? Same object? 
it's the obvious. Yeah, he's explaining the, basically the same explanation to two different groups. Uh, why is that unreasonable? So G.I. Butler says it's unreasonable. It does not look reasonable on the face of it, that the apostle would have principally the same object in view in two different epistles. I'm not sure why that would be unreasonable, right? Uh, Paul often writes of the same things in different epistles. We yeah. even have, uh, even have uh, Jude, his epistle is almost identical to, I um, can't remember if it's First Peter or something like that. It, it's basically just uh, an abbreviation of that epistle, that letter, right? So why, why did that happen? Uh, it, is it unreasonable for there to be four Gospels telling the same story? Wouldn't it be more reasonable if we have one Gospel? Yeah, good point. Right. So, so obviously there's lots of repetition. And, and Paul is writing to different groups of people that have the same issues. Um, so, so I don't, I don't see the unreasonableness of that. Now he says these were written by direct inspiration of God to be the special guidance of the church. He was bringing out the great principles which should, sure, which should serve as the governing influence of the church for all future ages. We therefore believe it to be un, an unreasonable view that both have the same design. And that makes no sense. I mean, if you look at, uh, second Corinthians chapter three, and you read in the book of Hebrews, I mean, you see that there, you're, he's making some of the same arguments. So, um, dealing with the covenants, right? In the epistle to the Romans, after a few preliminary remarks, Paul sets before us the condition of the heathen world and how they came to forget God in their terrible degradation. They certainly needed a savior, yet they were amenable to the law of God, for it had originally been written in the heart at creation, and some remnant of the work of it still remains. So he's dealing with the first chapter of Romans, right? For that which should be known of um, known of God is clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, so that they are without excuse, you know, section. And talking about what happens if we uh, reject God, what kind of things we end up doing. Um but the Jews had a great advantage inasmuch as the living oracles were directly placed in their keeping. They had constant access to them, but had as constantly transgressed them. The apostle plainly proved all of them to be under sin. All had gone astray. None did good. No, not one. He concludes, what then? Are we Jews better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before both, before proved both Jews and Gentiles that all are under sin. Every mouth was stopped and all the world became guilty before God. Law was not made void, but established. The apostle proceeds in a most lucid and powerful argument to show the agency of the moral law in the plan of salvation in all its various relations to the sinner. The necessity of faith in Christ in order that the lawbreaker may be justified, its agency in the death of the old carnal man, and its necessity as a standard of right doing, which the repentant sinner alone can reach by the assistance of Christ through the Holy Spirit. To the epistle to the Romans, we ever look for the most complete and thorough exposition of the law of God in its relation to the plan of salvation and the ultimate justification of a repentant transgressor of it. So that's, you just say that is what the book of Romans is about. It's about upholding the law. But is the scheme of the letter to the Galatians the same? Because the apostle have in view the same object. We think he had a widely different end in view. Instead of trying to impress upon Jew and Gentile alike the obligation of the moral law as his main object, he has constantly in view a class of Judaizing teachers who had troubled the disciples and introduced doctrines which subverted the principles of the gospel. The believers had been turned away from the faith by these, by these teachings to another gospel. They had loved the great apostle when they first received the truth, with a fervency which would have prompted them to pluck out their eyes for him. But through the influence of these disturbing teachers, that love had been almost lost. Paul was greatly grieved at this sudden change in their feelings and views. Throughout the whole epistle, he constantly refers to it, reproaching them for their sudden change and appealing to them to return to their former position. So there's a lot of truth in what he's saying here, that there is 
this issue of these Judaizing teachers. <clears throat> what was the change in them of which he complained so strongly? Was it that they had kept the moral law so well, had observed the Sabbath, refrained from idolatry, blasphemy, murder, lying, stealing, etc., that they felt they were justified by the good works and therefore needed no faith in a crucified Savior? Or was it that they had accepted circumcision with all it implied and symbolized, the law and laws and services which served as a wall of separation between Jews and Gentiles and the ordinances of the typical remedial system? We unhesitatingly affirm it was the latter. In endorsing the formal remedial system of types and shadows, they virtually denied that Christ, the substance to which all these types pointed, had come. Hence, the error was a fundamental one in doctrine, though they might not realize it. This was why Paul spoke so forcibly and pointed out their error with such strength and language. Their error involved practices which were subversive of the principles of the gospel. They were not merely errors of opinion, right? So, so we see this in some of Paul's other letters as well. So you're going to see this in Colossians. You're going to have the same issue. So why would the Apostle Paul deal with the same subject in two different letters? Well, and, and the question is, is the answer the same? So anyway, he says, um, He's going to go through and show this, what, what is being uh, said about to the, to the, the Galatians. So, uh, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you unto the grace of Christ unto another gospel. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth. But now after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto you desire again to be in bondage. I'm afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is the debtor to do the whole law. He did run well, who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they can constrain you to be circumcised only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. It will be noticed that these texts are selected all through the epistle. Many others of similar import could also be given. They relate to the principal theme of the apostle's mind, which caused him to write this letter to the Galatians. He had one leading object in view, hence he is constantly referring to it. The errors in the Galatian church, which Paul was so vigorously combating, were not merely the theoretical view that they were justified by their obedience to the moral law and hence not needed, needed not a savior, but they, they were practices which really undermined the truth of the gospel, connecting it with circumcision, the symbol of all those laws peculiarly the Jewish. Now, of course, he's in, in saying this here, we know that Jones and Wagner never taught that the problem was that people were trying to obey the moral law. It's, so in answer to this problem of the Judaizers, Paul presents an argument. And the argument has to do not so much with the ceremonial law, but as with the moral law, right? And this is what he can't seem um, to understand, Butler can't seem to understand that in order to, to address this problem, he doesn't address it by saying we are no longer under the ceremonial law, right? Butler thinks that that's what, how Paul is addressing it, but he's addressing it more at the root, as we will see. Um, we do not here quote these texts to make an argument upon them. We reserve them for their proper connection which we examine the epistle, which when we examine the epistle point by point, we present them now as an illustration of what was specially occupying the apostles' thoughts from one end of the epistle to the other. He apparently could not keep out of his mind the fundamental errors into which these, these children of the faith were fallen. These errors of doctrine he had to meet where, wherever he met a Jew. Throughout the whole Christian, his whole Christian life, he had to fight them. Because of the bitterness of feeling entertained by the Jews, 
the bitterness of feeling entertained by the Jews in sustaining their claims to superiority because of these separating laws involved in circumcision. Now, as again, remember, Paul is, is writing to Christians, not to just to Jews. These are Christians who accept Christ. And that some of these Christians are, are using, instead of the gospel, they're, they're, they're not really accepting the gospel as the answer to, to, to the sin problem. They're still basically using works. And the works that they're using are not so much the, um, the ceremonial law, though, the, though circumcision we could consider part of that, though that precedes the ceremonial law itself. But they are using outward forms as a way of uh, se- securing special favor with God. And a lot of these forms are are not necessarily part of the law. They're actually more part of Judaism. They're more cultural issues, right? That is, uh, for many Jews, the idea of associating with Gentiles is a problem, even after they become Christians, right? So so there's this separation between the Gentiles. So some Jews don't mind Gentiles becoming Christians, if they become Jews, right? So the issue here is these Gentiles who are now becoming Christians. Well, if you're going to become a Christian, you need to become a Jew, right? That is, they're seeing them as proselytes to the Jewish religion. And Paul is arguing that they're not proselytes to the Jewish religion, that a Gentile does not need to become a Jew to become a Christian, right? So, so, Butler doesn't quite get this point. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't address that point. Okay. And then he says, there are no doubt several, several references to the moral law in the epistle. Indeed, we do not see how it could be, could well be otherwise while discussing the remedial system providing pardon in figure for violation of that law. In some places, the apostle uses arguments which will embrace that and all systems of law and which may and do refer to and include both. But we emphatically deny that the law of God is the leading subject under consideration in this letter. We now propose to examine the whole epistle consecutively, having a relation to this subject to enable the reader to easily follow us. We will quote the language of the apostle. Now, he's going to basically do a short commentary and and I don't want to go through this whole thing. Um, I'm just trying to see how many pages we are here. I looked at it before. It's quite a bit. So if we were going to go through his commentary on Galatians, I'm just. He's going through the verses, it looks like. huh? Yeah, he's going to go through the verses and then he's going to discuss each of them. Now, now um, Wagner is going to respond to this and he's going to bring out some of the different points and verses and and Wagner's book's actually shorter than Butler's. So, you know, if we were going to go through this, I think it would roughly take us, you know, a couple of months probably to get through reading it. Yeah, it looks like Uh, it, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, so we're not going to read the rest of his book, uh, but I do want to get to his conclusion, if I can find it. Okay, so we're going to read here. Okay, then comes the grand conclusion of the argument of the apostle, not only to the in, in immediate connection, but of all he has said in the whole epistle thus far. We have re- referred to it several times, but we are sure it will be in place again. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Now, the issue here is not so much. Now, when he says the whole law, which law is he referring to? Right. That's the issue. And. So, so the idea that Butler has is this is the ceremonial law, 
that if, if you're circumcised, that means you have to do the ceremonial law. You have to do everything. When you, see, when you see circumcision connected to it. Right. But what Paul is saying is that when you're circumcised, you're showing that it's, it's that it's the old covenant symbol. The law in the old covenant that is the issue is the moral law, not the ceremonial law. Right. If if we are circumcised, what Paul is saying is that you have to be perfect. Right. You you don't have any forgiveness for your sins. That is, you can't be justified by the law. That is the moral law. Right. So. Here, if, if he's going to say that he's a debtor to the whole law, that justified by the law, that must be the same law. And when he talks about justified by the law, he's always talking about the moral law, right? Not the ceremonial law. Mother goes on, he says, these are strong, emphatic, and most powerful words. They would never have been called out from the meek apostle except a great crisis existed. Uh, the very foundation of the gospel system was involved in this question of circumcision. They were circumcised. They were debtors to do the whole law. Circumcision was the sign of the whole mosaic system. They must offer sacrifices, regard the special laws concerning uncleanness, et cetera, et cetera. All right. So that is Butler's view. Now, we're going to look, we're going to go to Wagner's book. Now, Wagner's going to address a lot of these um uh, these points. Now, uh, with this book here, uh, so this is E.J. Wagner's response. So obviously, we didn't go through all of Butler's book, but we have the basic idea of what he's saying, and and Wagner's going to quote at length uh, different sections of Butler's book and look at the different arguments. So, of course, it's on the E.G. White Disc. Anybody can go and read all of Butler's book if you want, but it's going to be way too long for us to do. Okay. Now, so it's going to be two years later that Wagner is going to respond. Now, he's going to write initially... um, so he says here, this letter was written at the date indicated. So he's going to write it in 1886 in response to Butler's book. But for certain reasons, it was thought best to delete it out. Um, chief among these reasons was the fear of seeming to act precipitately in the matter and the desire to counsel with others of larger experience. The delay of nearly two years has been given ample time to carefully review the subject again and again, and to avoid any appearance of heated controversy. It is thought best, even at this late date, to send the matter out in the form of a letter, as originally written. It will be understood, of course, that this does not purport to be an explanation of the book of Galatians. That would require a book many times the size of this. I have here endeavored merely to correct some erroneous views so that those who read may be prepared to study the epistle to the Galatians, with more profit than heretofore. It should also be stated that this little book is not published for general circulation. It is designed only for those in whose hands Elder Butler's pamphlet on Galatians was placed, and perhaps a few others whose minds have been specially exercised on the subject. No one can be more anxious than the writer to avoid everything of a controversial nature in matters attended for the general public, that this letter may tend to um, allay controversy to help bring the household of God into the unity of the faith as it is in Christ Jesus and to hasten the time when the servants of God shall see eye to eye is the only des- desire of the writer, E.J. Wagner. So, and this, he dates February 10th, 1887. <clears throat> so he wrote the book earlier in 1886 for the response. So dear brother, it's obviously, uh, to G.I. Butler. The matter of the law in Galatians, which received some attention at the late general conference, and and, the, and he's going to not be talking about the 1888 general conference. I think it's the 1886 general conference. Um, I'm pretty sure. I don't think it was 1885. 
um, has been upon my mind a good deal. And doubtless many have thought it since then more than before, thought of it since then more than before. I very much regretted that every moment of time was so occupied that we could have no conversation upon the subject. It is true the matter was discussed to a very limited extent in the meetings of the theological committee. But of course, the little that could be said under the circumstances was not sufficient to give any satisfaction to any party concerned. I know that you are at at all times exceedingly busy, and I myself have no time to squander, but this matter is of great importance and has received so much attention that it cannot by any possibility be ignored now. You remember that I stated that there were some points in your pamphlet which seemed to me to indicate that you had misunderstood my position, right? So this is one of the issues that you see in Butler's uh, pamphlet or book. Um, that he's not understanding where Wagner is coming from. He's, if he isn't understanding it, if, if he is understanding it, he's misrepresenting it, right? I therefore wish to note a few of them. Before taking up any of the details, I wish to say first that, as I assured you when in Battle Creek, I have not the slightest personal feeling in this matter. What I have written in the signs has been with the sole design of doing good by conveying instruction on an important Bible subject. And I've not written in a controversial manner, but have particularly avoided anything of that nature. It has been my aim on this subject, as well as on others, to write in such a way as not to arouse combativeness in any, but to present simple Bible truth, so that the objections would be taken out of the way before the person could make them. So he's describing uh, something that we should all do when, when we're dealing with people who may differ in how we're, uh, in what we believe, is that you try to answer objections uh, before they're made, right? So that as you try to state things in a way that a person can see, instead of just fighting at the main point where you disagree, you, you start dealing with other things that you can agree upon so that the person can see why you've come to the conclusion that you have. Uh, second, it is not possible that in noting a few of the points in your pamphlet, I could properly present my own position. To do that, I should want to take up the book of Galatians without any reference to what anybody else had said upon it. In my articles in the signs, I've mentioned only a few points that might seem to be objections to the law and which are often quoted as showing its abolition to show that they are really the strongest arguments for the per per perpetuity of the law. Right. And we'll, we'll see that point more clearly. I wish to say also that I think great injustice has been done in the allusions that have been made to the instructor, instructor lessons. So remember, we were reading last week about Butler's objection to the youth instructor having these lessons that were promoting Wagner's ideas as well as the signs. Right. Um, and, and the Sabbath school. Um, I think this might actually, this instructor might be the Sabbath school instructor. Anyway, if it, it were simply injustice to me, it would be a matter of small consequence. But discredit was thrown upon the lessons, which would materially weaken the influence of the important subject upon which they treated. And this too, when not a text is used in the lessons, was given a different application from that which has been held by those, at least of our people who have written upon the same subject. Every position taken in those lessons is in perfect harmony, is perfectly in harmony with works published by our people um, before the appearance of your pamphlet. This being the case, I honestly think that justice demands that on this subject, at least the impressions conveyed in your pamphlet should be as publicly corrected. Right. So there's obviously, you know, from Wagner's point of view, misrepresentation going on that, that needs to be apologized about. And, and we see these types of things happening in the movement at the present time. You know, people presenting what, what they think somebody else is saying and misrepresenting it. Um, so, you know, it's something we have to be careful about that we don't do. As to the pri propriety of publishing the matter in the signs when I did, I have nothing to say. Whatever censure is due on that score, I willingly take, as I already have. But I wish to say that nothing that has been said or written 
has in the least degree shaken my confidence in the truthfulness of what I published in the signs. Those positions I hold to and rejoice in today more strongly than ever. I wish also most earnestly to protest against the accusation that I've made the signs, much less the instructor, a medium for taking an unfair advantage of any of our people. Quotations that will appear further on will show that I'm not the one who has departed from the standard works of our people. I will now proceed to notice a few points in the pamphlet, taking them up in the order in which they come. On page eight, you say, the Lord chose Abraham and his descendants to be his peculiar people. They were such till the cross. He gave them the right of circumcision, a circle cut in the flesh, as a sign of their separation from the rest of the human family. So we read that last week that, um, that in, in Butler's book. He says, Wagner does, this seeming misapprehension of the nature of circumcision appears throughout your pamphlet. It seems strange that it should be so when the Apostle Paul speaks so plainly concerning it. In Romans 4.11, I read of Abraham, and he received the sign of circumcision a seal of the righteousness of faith, of the faith which he had yet been uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. Now, so what Butler is arguing is that was the purpose of circumcision was to show this distinction, a sign of separation from the rest of the human family. And, and that was not the purpose of circumcision, and we talked about, I think, last week, um, that circumcision was, uh, you know, it's connected to baptism as a symbol. It's it's not trusting in the flesh. It's part of the covenant that God has made uh, with Abraham, and Abraham is supposed to be, um, you know, the father of many nations, right? I mean, the whole idea about Abraham is that he is to be a light to the world, right? He's, he's, not, he's not given circumcision as something to separate him from the world. Also, um, um, with, with Abraham and his circumcision, he is, um, with circumcision at that time, it, it was only priests that were circumcised in like, like circumcision was not something the Jews invented. It existed, but in the pagan nations around them, only priests would be circumcised. But here the Jews are actually all being circumcised, showing that this is a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Right. So that means that they are priests to the world. Right. That's that's purpose of circumcision to show that as a symbol and so so the idea that it is this to be a sign of separation from the rest of the human family maybe it became that way to the jews later on but that's not was not the intention right so the fitness of this right as a sign of righteousness will readily appear to anybody who understands the physical evils against which circumcision is a guard present time it is often performed by physicians as a preventative of physical impurity it was practiced for this purpose by many nations of antiquity uh, herodias says of the egyptians they practice circumcision for the sake of cleanliness considering it better to be cleanly than comely and professor von orelli of basel says in the shaf herzog encyclopedia the custom is also found among nations which have no traceable connection with any form of ancient civilization, as for instance, among the Congo Negroes and the Kafrarians in Africa and the Salivas Indians in South America, the inhabitants of Otaheite and the Fiji Islands, etc. He adds the Arabs of today call the operation Tutor Tahir purification. I think among the Jews as a class, the right exists today only as a preventative of physical impurity. I was present when it was performed by an eminent rabbi of San Francisco, and he said that that was all it was for. In this, as in everything else, the Jews have lost all knowledge of the spiritual meaning of their ceremonies. The veil still remains over their hearts. But that cutting off of 
the cause of physical impurity signified the putting off of the impurity of the heart, which was accomplished by faith in Christ. See Deuteronomy 10, 16, and many other texts for proof that circumcision had from the beginning this deeper meaning. We need to be careful, especially careful how and what we say to today with instant modern media. Um, what's that a comment about, Kelly? I don't understand. Kelly made a comment. I'm not sure what the context of that is. Sorry, I was lost in cyberspace looking for something else. Uh, it, it, it's about it's about what you said a while back, and I had a little time tapping it out. But uh, about uh, how when Butler and was it Joan? Hmm? Uh, anyway, when they were commenting back and forth to each other, and how the comment about today, even today, it can happen where people will misrepresent what we're saying, thinking they know what we're saying, but misunderstanding us and and thus rep- misrepresenting what we're saying. So uh, an instant, the instantness of today's media, it's so easy to be misunderstood. Well, yes. That's all. But, uh, yeah, and, and also just, it's not so much even just, I mean, the instant, the thing is we can write a statement and just post it and not really think about what we wrote right? Or respond to something that we think we're responding to, but we haven't really read what we're responding to, right? So it's important to take time to listen to people. But but I think that problem was existing back then with the perceived slights that we have with Butler. He believes that there's these slights. He's feeling, I believe, actually hurt and, and threatened by what Jones and Wagner were teaching. And instead of talking to them and clarifying the issues, what they were doing is talking amongst themselves about what they thought Jones and Wagner were doing. And we've had those same types of things happen. We've experienced them ourselves. We've done them and we've also uh, had them done to us. Right. So we have to be careful on that point. Um, so I would agree with that. Okay, so we get this image here. Just see what that is. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> the question will naturally arise: If circumcision was practiced by other people, why did everybody despise the Jews because of it? I answered that the hatred was due not to the mere fact of circumcision, but to that which it signified among the pious Jews. The wicked plotteth against the just and gnasheth upon him with his teeth. All they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And this is true of all time. Um, As a proof that the uncircumcised heathen hated the Jews solely on account of their righteousness and not on account of their circumcision, we have only to note how ready they were to mingle with the Jews whenever they could seduce them into idolatry. If the Jews would relax their strictness of living, would depart from God and serve other gods, the heathen had no objections to mingling with them and intermarrying with them. As this leads to the main point, namely, that the mere act of circumcision never made the Jews God's peculiar people. They were his peculiar people only when they had that of which circumcision was the sign, namely righteousness. When they did not have that, they were just the same as though They had never been circumcised and were cut off without mercy as readily as were the heathen. Circumcision was only a sign of the possession of righteousness. And when righteousness was wanting, the circumcision amounted to nothing. On page 10, I read of the Jews. Then came the cross when all their special privileges with circumcision as their representative and sign were swept away. They had forfeited them by disobedience and rebellion. We read that at the start of the study. On page 11, I also read of the Jew. He greatly disliked to be reckoned a common sinner with the hated Gentile. He strenuously contended also for circumcision and its attendant privileges. But on page 37, I read, the law of rights had an immense amount of these so that they constituted a yoke of bondage, grievous to be born, which Paul claimed had passed away. I cannot harmonize this last quotation with the first two. 
How can a yoke of bondage be considered as um, uh, a special as special privileges? And why should the Jew strenuously contend for circumcision and its attendant privileges if he felt it to be a yoke of bondage grievous to be born? This is a minor matter, but consistently uh, should appear in the details. Consistency should appear in the details of truth. I will not at present take time to give my views of the yoke of bondage, but we'll consider it later. On page 12, concerning the books of Romans and Galatians, I read, um, we cannot agree with some who claim that the design scheme or argument of the two epistles are substantially the same. We freely admit that there are expressions alike in both, but we believe that the main line of argument and the ultimate object in view are widely different, and that many of the similar expressions used are to be understood in a different sense, because the argument in the apostle demands it. Um, in the other epistles of Paul, these facts are averted to, but in none of them is the argument anywhere near so fully developed. It does not look reasonable on the face of it that the apostle would have principally the same object in view in two different epistles, right? So we went through this already. So he says, we therefore believe it to be an unreasonable view that both have the same design. So here's Wagner's response. You say it does not look reasonable that the apostle would have principally the same object in view in two different epistles. This is not an argument, but an opinion, an opinion which I do not share. It does not seem any less reasonable to me that Paul should have principally the same object in view, as in the case in the four Gospels. Um, and it seems fully as reasonable as that the prophets Daniel and John should have written two books with principally the same object in view, namely to enlighten the church in regard to things to take place in the last days, or that the books of First and Second Chronicles should cover the ground covered in the books of Samuel and Kings, or that Paul's epistle to Titus should contain so much that is in the epistle to Timothy, or that the book of Jude should be an almost exact reproduction in brief of the second epistle of Peter. So he repeated almost the same arguments I had. Instead of Paul not having the same general object in view in two epistles, in, I find the same points brought out in Ephesians and Colossians, uh, though not to the extent that they are in Romans and Galatians. To me, it seems very reasonable that the same thing should be presented from different points of view, especially when addressed to different people and under different circumstances. I find that things that are dwelt upon at considerable length in one of the testimonies for the church are repeated and emphasized in others. And it seems to me very fitting and necessary that this should be done. Well, these, though, though these are addressed on the same, um, to the same churches, not to different ones, this is in accordance with the Bible rule of line upon line, precept upon precept. You say that similar terms and even identical terms need not necessarily have the same meaning. And this may be true provided they are used with reference to different subjects. <clears throat> but if the same subject is under consideration in two different places and the same or similar terms are used in each places, then we are bound to admit that they have the same meaning. If we do not do this, we cannot interpret the Bible at all. It is on this basis alone that we can understand the prophecies. If you will turn to the comments in the 13th, on the 13th chapter in Daniel, in thoughts on the book of Daniel and Revelation, you will find that similarity of statement is all that is depended upon to prove that the leopard beast is identical with the little horn of Daniel 7. No one has ever thought of questioning the argument in that place, and not one has any right to do. Now, let us look for a moment on the subject of the two books, Romans and Galatians. The leading thought in the book of Romans is justification by faith. The apostle shows the depraved condition of the heathen world, and he shows that the Jews are no better, but that human nature is the same in all. All have sinned, and all are guilty before God, and the only way that any can escape final condemnation is by faith in the blood of Christ. All who believe on him are justified freely by the grace of God, and his righteousness is imputed to them, although they have violated the law. This truth, which is brought out so clearly in the third chapter of Romans, is repeated and emphasized in the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh chapters. And in the eighth chapter, the apostle concludes that there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. He has before shown that all sinners are under or condemned by the law, but when we come to God through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, we are no longer under the law. 
but under grace. This condition is represented in various places as dead to the law by the body of Christ, delivered from the law, etc. Everywhere, faith in Christ and justification by faith are made prominent. So we may say that justification by faith is the keynote of the book of Romans. Now, how about the book of Galatians? There's no question in my mind of any uh, but that the Galatians were being induced to submit to circumcision. They were submitting to the demands of the Jews that they should be circumcised because they thought it a great privilege to be circumcised not by any means. But because certain Jews were teaching them that if they were not circumcised, they could not be saved. And you would have to see Acts 15 verse 1. They were therefore looking to circumcision as a means of justification. But since there is none other name under heaven except that of Christ, whereby we can be saved, it follows that to depend on anything except Christ for justification is a rejection of Christ. It was thus, it was this which called out Paul's letter to them. Now, since the Galatians were being led to trust in circumcision for justification from sin, what else could be the burden of a letter designed to correct this error but justification by faith in Christ? That this is the burden of the epistle is seen from Galatians 2, 16 to 21, 3, verse 6 to 8, and 10 and 14, 22, 24, 26, 27, and 4, verse 4 to 7, 5, verse 5, 6, and 6, verse 14 and 15, and other passages. In the book of Romans, the apostle develops his argument on justification by faith in a general way, building up a general treatise. But when he wrote to the Galatians, he had a special object in view, and he adapted his epistle to the necessities of the case. It is the most natural thing in the world that he should write on justification by faith to the Galatians when they were in danger of losing their faith even if his treatise on that subject to the Romans had already been written. The truth is, however, that the book of Galatians was written first. In the book of Romans, he expanded the book of Galatians into a general treatise, which is a really good point there. On page 13 of your pamphlet, I find a paragraph which must necessarily be misleading to those who have not read my articles. You say, what was the change in them of which he complained so strongly? Was it that they had kept the moral law so well, had observed the Sabbath, refrained from idolatry, blasphemy, murder, and lying, stealing, etc., that they felt they were justified by their good works and therefore needed no faith in a crucified Savior? Or was it that they had accepted circumcision with all it implied and symbolized, the laws and services which served as a wall of separation between Jews and Gentiles, and the ordinances of the typical remedial system. We unhesitatingly affirm that it was the latter. In endorsing the form of remedial systems of types and shadows, they virtually denied that Christ, the substance to which all these types pointed, had come. Hence, their error was a fundamental one in doctrine, though they might not realize it. This was why Paul spoke so forcibly and pointed out their error with such strength of language. Their error involved practices which were subversive of the principles of the gospel. They were not merely errors of opinion. So we had read that in Butler. We read it again. And Wagner responds. Anyone who had not read my articles would naturally conclude on reading the above that I claimed that the Galatians were most strict in the verb observance of the Ten Commandments, and that by this means they expected to be justified from past transgression. That is the very opposite of what I taught. I made it clear as I knew how that the Galatians were accepting circumcision with all it implied and symbolized, and were accepting the Jewish error that circumcision was the only means of justification. We cannot suppose that the Jews who were thus seeking to turn the Galatians away from the faith taught them to ignore the Ten Commandments, but we do not know that they did not, we do not know that they did not teach them to rely solely upon, but we do know that they did not teach them to rely solely upon their observance of the moral law as a means of justification. The true gospel 
is to keep the commandments of God in the faith of Jesus. The perverted gospel, which the Galatians were being taught, was to keep the commandments of God and circumcision. But since circumcision is nothing, and there is in the universe no means of justification outside of Christ, it follows that they were practically relying upon their good works for salvation. Now, remember, Paul mentions uh, about circumcision at three different places where he has these parallel statements. He, he says in one, um, circumcision is nothing, neither uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. And other times he says the same thing, but the keeping of the commandments of God. And um, the other time he says, Circumcision availeth not, neither uncircumcision, but a new creature. And, and these are really powerful if you do these in a study with people who uh, want to understand about uh, the law of God. Because there's the keeping of the commandments of God, faith which worketh by love, and a new creature are all synonymous. Because circumcision doesn't avail, neither uncircumcision but faith that worketh by love, the keeping of the commandments of God and a new creature. So um, so in understanding this issue of circumcision here, they were using circumcision as a means of justification, as Wagner points out. But since circumcision is nothing, there is no, there is in the universe no means of justification outside of Christ. It follows that they were practically relying on the good works for salvation. And that was that was really the issue. But Christ says, without me, he can do nothing. That is, the man who rejects Christ by accepting some other mode of justification cannot possibly keep the commandments. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. So we find that the Galatians, although they had once accepted Christ and known God, were now insensibly turning away from God. And of course, going back to the heathen practices, which came so naturally to them. This is shown by several expressions. First, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you unto the grace of Christ, unto another gospel, which is not another. Galatians 1, verse 6 and 7. This shows that they were being removed from God, for God is the one who calls people unto the fellowship of his son. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 9. Again, we read, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, Galatians 4, 9. This shows that they were turning from God. Once more we read, ye, ye did show that, that that which made the case, wait, um, ye did run well, who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth, um, Galatians 5, 7. These passages clearly show that that which made the case so urgent was the fact that the Galatians were leaving the truth of God and going into idolatry. This was not because the Jews were teaching them to break the commandments, but because they were putting their trust in something besides Christ. And the man who does that cannot keep from sin, no matter how hard he tries. See Romans 8, verse 7 to 10. In Galatians 5.17, those who attempt to build their house on anything except the rock Christ Jesus are building for destruction. And so I believe as firmly as you can that their error was fundamental and a grave one. He says, I must go back to the 10th page and notice an expression which I find concerning the relative position of the Jews and Gentiles after the passing away of the ceremonial law. <clears throat> so he's the quote Butler again, there was no propriety, therefore, in still keeping up the wall of separation between them and the others. They all stood now upon the same level in the sight of God, all must approach him through the Messiah who had come into the world. Through him alone, man could be saved. Do you mean to intimate by this that there was ever a time when any people could approach God except through Christ? If not, then language means nothing. Your words seem to imply that before the first advent, men approached God by means of the ceremonial law, and that after that, they approached him through the Messiah. But we shall have to go outside the Bible to find any support for the idea 
that anybody could ever approach God except through Christ. Amos 5.22, Micah 6, verse 68, and many other texts show conclusively that the ceremonial law alone could never enable people to come to God. These points will come in again later. I pass on to your consideration of the second chapter. I do not think there is anyone um, whose opinion is worth considering who will question for a moment your statement that the visit referred to in the first verse in this chapter is the same as the one of which we have an account in Acts 15. I certainly agree with you there. If you will notice, I made a distinct point on this in my articles. In fact, I insisted upon it as a necessary foundation of my argument. I've repeated several times what I have already stated in this letter, that the epistle to the Galatians was called out by the very same thing which the certain men who came down to Antioch were teaching, namely, Except ye be circumcised, ye cannot be saved. I agree with you that the very same question precisely, which came before the council, is the main subject of the apostle's letter to this church. But I do not agree with you in all that you say in the words immediately following, which I find on page 25 of your pamphlet. Will any Seventh-day Adventist claim that the moral law was the subject considered by that council? Was it the moral law, which Peter characterizes as a yoke, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Were the moral and ceremonial laws all mixed up and confounded in the council? Did the decision of that body set aside the laws against stealing, lying, Sabbath breaking, and murder? We all know better. The council took no cognizance, whatever, of the Ten Commandments. <clears throat> so here's Wagner's response to that. Do you really believe that the council took no cognizance of the Ten Commandments? If so, can you tell me of what law fornication is the transgression? Fornication is one of the four things forbidden by the council. Now, I have a very distinct recollection of some plain talk which you gave on this subject at the General Conference and some still plainer testimony from Sister White, all of which I thought was very pertinent. You prove from Scripture that the Seventh Commandment may be broken by even a look, or desire of the heart, and yet you claim that the council which forbade fornication took no cognizance whatever of the Ten Commandments. How you can make such a statement after reading the 15th chapter of Acts is beyond my comprehension. Again, another thing which was forbidden by the council was pollution of idols. That certainly must have some connection with the First and Second Commandments, to say nothing of other commandments that were broken in idolatrous feasts. I should be extremely sorry to have people get the idea that we do not regard pollutions of idols or fornication as violations of the moral law. We claim that it is the ceremonial law alone which was under consideration in that council. Will you please cite me to that portion of the ceremonial law which forbids fornication and idolatry? This is an important matter, and right here, the whole argument falls to the ground. We very properly connect the book of Galatians with the 15th chapter of Acts. You justly claim that in Galatians, Paul pursues the same line of argument which was pursued in the council. And you depend on the assumption that the council took no cognizance of the, cognizance of the moral law in order to prove that the moral law does not come into the account of, in Galatians. But a simple reading of the report of the council shows that the moral law did come in there. And therefore, according to your own argument, the moral law must be considered in the book of Galatians. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to come back to this next week, and we're going to we're going to actually um, backtrack. When we come to this next week, uh, we're going to take a bit more uh, time to look at this what they're arguing about here, this uh, Jerusalem Council, and we're going to look at some statements in the spirit of prophecy regarding it. So I'm just bookmarking this here. So no, that's marking my place there. Uh, any, any comments about what we're seeing here in this discussion? So, I mean, uh, the nice thing about uh, Wagner is he does give, you know, fair quotes from Butler, as you can see. Right. So he's he's quoting him in context. He's not misrepresenting what Butler's saying. And we do get a good impression, uh, you know, understanding what Butler is, what his arguments are. So you can see that the parts we read in the What's that? This is really 
this has really helped uh, help me uh, see it a lot clearer. Like uh, in Galatians, was it speaking about the moral law or the ceremonial law? It was talking about both of them. And uh, this has really helped mm-hmm. a lot. Uh, I've ha- always had a uh, trouble understanding Jones and Wagner and writings of the pioneers. They they're so uh, ahead of their time, I think, in the way they they they, they write they're quite intellectually. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. And so it's, it's a, this this is an important point. This this issue that that was is often framed as the issue of 1888. Right? It was all about the law on Galatians. But we're going to see as we get deeper into it. On the surface, it was about, you know, what is law in Galatians? But there was actually a complete um, uh, disconnect between one group of people of how they understood the Bible and righteousness by faith and what Jones and Wagner were teaching. And and so for, for G.I. Well, Butler, it was about you're teaching, you're I would, teaching this I would, wrong idea. I would interject there about uh, what you just said about, what, what, please uh, go back a sentence about how something people do are doing. Uh, uh, I just saw okay. an application for today. For whatever it was that you were saying, I, I just... I just saw an application even today that this happens, whatever it was that you were just saying about how people take each other wrong or. Right. No. We, we, we don't listen. Important. Okay. And, and we, we, so, so sometimes there's a disconnect. So let's say. That's what I was saying. That's what yeah. I was thinking, right? Yeah. So, so you have a group disconnect. of people, you know, or you have two people. Let's just have two people. And the one person is just on a different wavelength. He doesn't understand what the other person is saying, right? And yeah, we only understand as much as from what our point of view and understanding is already. It's difficult to think outside of the box for us. I, I remember I had a practical application of this when I was at Silver Hills. Um, a guy named Ken Manning and Leroy Proctor, uh, two very different individuals. Ken Manning was highly intellectual. He had uh, he had a degree in engineering. He actually worked on the, the computers for the space shuttle program. So he had worked for the, um, uh, for NASA, right? And, um, mm-hmm. and, and then you had Leroy Proctor who was basically uneducated. Um, he didn't, I, I think he had like a grade nine education. Now, Leroy Proctor was an extremely practical guy, really good inventor and, and so forth. Mm-hmm. Um, they were having a discussion one time and, and they were arguing and they weren't actually even talking about the same thing. They were actually completely on different topics, but they were so used not to listening to the other person when they talked that they didn't even know that they were talking. They were so about the same What's that? They were so used to the other person being what? They were so used to the other person being wrong. Yeah. Joke. Yeah. And then I pointed so out to them. <laughs> yeah, they didn't listen. Right. So I, I pointed this out. To them. They kind of looked at me and they said, well, what were you talking about? Well, I was talking about this other topic. Right. I was talking about this. I was talking about this. It, it was hilarious. Mm-hmm. So so sometimes more, it's like yeah, even when we're talking about the same topic, we're, we're sort of talking from our point of view and not really understanding what the other person is saying. Yep. Mm-hmm. Oh, so true. Yeah. Anyway, we're gonna we're gonna look at this again next week. We're gonna look at the Jerusalem Council a bit and some stuff that Ellen White says about it. And, um so anyway, any other comments before we close in prayer? Okay, let's pray. Yeah, I was looking at Galatians yeah. three, three, sorry, three, one through three, and there I see that we can begin in the spirit, and we're supposed to run well, and we're supposed to be studying His Word and imbibing His Word, internalizing His Word, and then we do the good works. But if we're putting Christ plus good works for salvation, we're actually being bewitched, and it's like going back to idolatry, going back to satanic bondage 
So Lord help us to keep going forward yeah. <laughs> and not rely on our good works, no matter what our intentions are. If we're trying to save ourselves by good works, we're not saving ourselves. We're damning ourselves. Right. Yeah. So you don't begin by, you know, first confessing your sins to Christ and asking him to forgive, you know, to forgive you and empower you. But then, you know, trust in the fact that you're you're not doing some of the bad things you did before and you're doing other things. But this is pretty common with human beings is that we start to look at ourselves and to think that somehow there's some virtue in us. And all virtue, all goodness, all righteousness is in Christ. Now, Christ will live in us and his righteousness will be expressed in our lives. But it's his righteousness, not our righteousness. Because only God is good. Only God is righteous. So we're going to see this too, this, this sort of disconnect of, of, uh, of the question. Yeah. Uh, so it's his righteousness, Christ's righteousness. Uh, what whose right doing is it it's well it's Christ's right righteousness is just right doing okay. it's Christ's righteousness it's God working in us Jesus says of my own self I can do nothing the works that you see they come from the father so Christ he could have done, had his own righteousness but he chose right. not to use he his righteousness but his father faith. Right. right. So he posted so, in his father. So now, one of the other dangers, one of the other dangers that that I know for sure are strong will. A person with a strong will, when they put their mm-hmm. mind to something, they do it, and that can keep a person from being saved by because it keeps them away from the right doing of Christ because they can do it, mm-hmm. and 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 in the areas that count to them, that show them to be righteous. They, they, that's where they take their confidence and, and trust in what they can do. And boy, oh boy, the day yeah. comes and has to come where, where they run up against something that they can't do. And that, it, that's where we have the opportunity to put ourselves on the altar. Right. Well, the altar is an appointed meeting place between the soul and God. That, I read that the other day. This, the altar of self-sacrifice is the appointed meeting place between the soul and God. That's neat. I like it. And, and you bring up a good point because there are some people, let's say they have a very good control of appetite. And, and their gospel starts to become, you know, because control of appetite is important. Well, right? sure. It becomes what they're good at, right? It becomes becomes what they're they're good at. at. But but they may not be very good at mercy, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They may not be very loving or forgiving. They may be easily... How do we learn learn mercy? By having mercy given unto us. Right. And how do we have mercy given unto us? How do we have mercy given unto us? We don't have it unless we see our need of it. Right. Our great need of it. Yeah. And so all of these things come forth from God. They don't they don't emanate from the human heart. So so we will look at this and, and thanks for those comments. They're good comments. So we're gonna continue looking into this issue of the law in Galatians as we, we address this in in these studies. And and hopefully we can come to a much better understanding of ourselves and how we are very much like the Galatians. So let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for each person. We pray for one another, Lord, um, that you can continue the work that you have begun in us. We ask for forgiveness for the times that we are unaware of our sins and the way that we uh, hurt one another with our actions and our words. So we just pray that you can continue to show us our need of you and that we can depend upon you as Christ did by faith. We pray for the studies tomorrow and we just ask for your Holy Spirit um, to be with us throughout the Sabbath that we can be comforted 
in our sorrows and our trials. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.